leads us to the unfortunate conclusion that this latest murder was also the work of the so-called identity killer. Now, Inspector Danvers will take your questions. How can you be sure this is the identity killer's handiwork? Well, because as with his previous victims, he's left at the scene of the crime details of his identity. So the killer has a calling card? I suppose you could say that, yes. What is it? Well, on this occasion, it was uh, a calling card. But, uh, on previous occasions, he's been known to leave his birth certificate, the address of his MySpace page, <laughs> and on one occasion, a series of unconnected numbers next to the three-letter word MOB. So, uh, <laughs> We're looking into the possibility that there may be connections with organised crime. So, what have we got? Nothing, sir. All he's left this time is a passport size photograph and two recent utility bills. <laughs> oh, my God, sir, look at that. I know. What a waste. Look at this, Sarge. Well, it's still running, sir. Should we have a look at the tape? Ah, oh, what? So we're sitting around looking at footage of Mr. Eric Hale, flat two, Addington Building, Swindon, merging a man, and meanwhile the identity killer could strike again. <laughs> now, at this point, all we can do is just wait for him to make a mistake. Morning, <laughs> <laughs> sir. I don't think they're very well, Mum. It's the Helivet. We're the Helivets. Where's the pet or pets in peril? Who's the concerned owner or owners? We both are. Don't worry, young lady and old lady. We'll soon have your fish or fishes swimming around the plastic weed and under the tiny bridge again. They're dead. Wriggling in the gravel. They're dead. Sucking at the mermaid. Look. We can help him. We can't. Thanks for doing this, guys. I I'm really crazy about Jill. No problem, Liam. We enjoy playing matchmaker. Yeah, don't you worry about a thing. This whole evening has been set up to make you look good. You're going to shine in comparison to the other guests. So, so who else is coming? Well, there's Dave. <laughs> Great. No problems there. Well, that'll be Jill. D do I look OK? Yeah, that shirt really suits you. Everyone, this is Jill. Hi, hi. hi. Oh, hello. Hi. Hi. Well, let's sit down. <laughs> oh, is someone else joining us? Oh, just a Scarecrow. He's an old friend of Tara's from back home. He's just upstairs. We'll be down in a second. <laughs> Come on, Scarecrow. We're going to start without you. <laughs> Sorry. I was just admiring your Kandinsky prints upstairs. Oh, I love his work. I was lucky enough to catch a retrospective in Barcelona. It was stunning. Really? Oh, I'm, I'm Jill, by the way. Hi. I'm Scarecrow. What a fascinating name. Steve, can I have a word with you in the kitchen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what is it? Who the hell is he? He's Scarecrow. Tara knows him. Well, why do you have to invite him? He's charming the pants off her. Well, get in there and compete. He's just a Scarecrow. Yeah, but he's really smooth. I think she likes him. Liam, if you can't do better than a man with a family of rats living in his torso, then there's no hope for you with any woman. Yeah, all right. You're right. OK. Oh, there's something stuck in my jacket. <laughs> More wine, Jill? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I used to be really scared of birds. Oh, don't worry. I'll look after you. Ooh, my hero. So, uh, Scarecrow, tell me, how much does scaring crows pay? I only ask because I'm a senior marketing executive and I'm on about 70k. 
just wondered how Scarecrow compares. Oh, how can you put a price on the view of the valley? All the soft morning breezes. And watching the gentle rains sweeping across the landscape. As the tender corn heads brush sensuously at your side. And the nights, oh, the nights of countless stars. And the soul just ascends. Oh, God, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. What were you thinking? I'm getting whipped out there. Well, stop wasting time and get in the game. Look, Jill likes skiing, so when you get the chance, use that as an opening. All right. Well, there are two types of scarecrow. There are the ordinary scarecrows, and then there's the enchanted kind, like me. He's enchanted. That's fascinating. So, what's the difference? Well, an enchanted scarecrow can walk and talk. Oh, and you can do that thing with the moon in the poetry. Oh, come on. Don't make me do that. What thing? It's nothing. Do you ski at all, Jill? No, thanks. I'm fine. What's this thing you do? I'm fascinated. Oh, go on, do it, Scarecrow. <laughs> oh, all right. This is from my book, The Night Watchman. You're a published poet. It's only a slim volume. And do the moon thing, too. OK, OK. Sister Moon, shine down your gentle benevolence upon us. That's amazing. How did you do that? Enchanted. Well, all I can say is me too. And as the sun rose on a clean new day, none knew the night watchman had passed this way. That's just beautiful. I wish I could see the valley at night. Well, it's only half an hour away. We could all go now. I've got my BMW outside. <laughs> no, thanks. I think I might just get an early night. I'll, I'll uh, grab my bag. <laughs> thanks so much for setting this up, guys. I fancied her for ages. No problem, Scarecrow. And great choice with the other guy. What a tosser. Come on, Scarecrow. Let's go. Go on. Don't keep the lady waiting. Thanks again. Cheers, Dave. <laughs> All right, uh, see you later, Scarecrow. <laughs> so let's go through it one last time. All we've got is a name, an address, an occupation, a phone number, a modus operandi, motive, opportunity, a confession, and him in the room. Hi. <laughs> so, I ask you all, where the hell do we go from here? We could try arresting him, boss. Or is that just what he wants us to do? No, it isn't. <laughs> or is that just what he wants us to think? Look, I'm just gonna go. He's always that one step ahead of us. <laughs> and then on the Wednesday, Dan, it's the bath scene, Dan. Now, we've talked about this, haven't we? You're fine with the nudity, aren't you, Dan? Yeah, absolutely fine, yeah. I mean, people don't have baths with their pants on, right? Mm, exactly. <laughs> so I will be asking you to take your pants off <laughs> while I'm there. Fine. I think it's important to the realism of the film. Yeah, realism. Yeah. And it'll be a closed set, won't it? I mean, you know, I don't really want there to be too many people kind of hanging around while I'm, you know... While you're taking off all your clothes to be filmed. Yeah. Leave that to me, Dan. It'll just be like me and the cameraman. It'll be like that. Yes, you and the cameraman. And me, of course. Well, can't do a scene without the director. Not this scene. <laughs> and the sound man and four or five electricians to make sure you're lit nicely. And the continuity lady and the makeup lady and her assistant and the work experience girl. Right, but basically... But no need for the costume department. <laughs> because you won't have a costume on. You'll be bad. Right, no, of course they won't be there, yeah. So basically you'll be on your own. I mean, obviously, the props people and the designer need to be there. And I think that's the day the producer's bringing his wife and three teenage daughters. 
Right. But, I mean, it'll all be shot tastefully, won't it? I mean, obviously I'll be naked, but you won't actually see my penis. I'll see your penis, then. <laughs> I'll see it loud. Yeah, but sure, but, I mean, you won't actually be filming my penis. Well, there are no guarantees in this business, Dan, but if there's one thing I can say, it's that I'll try and avoid being very unsurprised if your penis doesn't not get filmed and put on general release up and down the land. Oh, well, that's a relief. <laughs> Three life sentences. <laughs> a spokesman said, you think you know a guy, and then he goes and does something like that. <laughs> Foreign news now, and at a special session of the United Nations, it was agreed that the war on terror is, in the words of a new resolution, just too difficult. <laughs> Instead, the Security Council has agreed to launch a war on the comedian and ornithologist Bill Oddie. <laughs> as a way of bringing the nations of the world together in a more achievable common cause. <laughs> Matt Long has this. It took them a little over six hours, but finally they came up with a name that suited all parties. We must join together in the face of this new menace. There can be no peace in the world until Bill Oddie is hunted down and completely destroyed. Well, it's a challenging new world that we live in, and uh, in that world, it had become increasingly clear that the need to confront uh, Bill Oddie had been growing. Um, it was only a matter of years before he developed a nuclear capacity, <laughs> uh, probably. For all we know, he already had a dirty bomb, and he meant to use it uh, on the tube tomorrow, for all we know. So that's why every army and intelligence agency is going to be out looking for him. Has he been notified? He has been notified. And how did he react? Well, how do you think? I'd say he's pretty much crapped himself. <laughs> but, you know, we're going to be giving him uh, 48 hours head start uh, to, to make it interesting. And uh, be in no doubt, uh, we are going to take him down. We're going to take him down hard. And uh, he needn't think he's going to get away with it this time. What if he seeks refuge with jihadi terrorists in Iraq or Pakistan? Oh, God, he won't do that, will he? <laughs> Is it true you're not wearing any underpants, Dan? Yes. Blimey. So, how's the rest of the filming going? The rest of... Oh, fine, Dan. We're all pleased with all the rest of the filming. I hope this bath isn't too cold. Well, that's what I meant to talk to you about, Dan. <laughs> I thought that rather than your character getting into a bath, what would be better is that if your character was still naked, but instead of getting into a bath, getting tied to the Wheel of Doom, <laughs> which is then revolved. What, why the change? We just thought it was more visually interesting. Yes. Yes, I suppose it is. Um, uh, who are all these people? Just some random people. <laughs> right. So we're a little bit pushed for time, Dan. So, uh, if you could just slip out of your dressing gown and get yourself tied to the Wheel of Doom, we'll start filming. Um, OK. Um, Gavin, y you are just filming me from here up, yeah? <laughs> Absolutely, Dan. Don't you worry. Oh, OK. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear whores. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> anyway, happy birthday, horse. Uh, carrot cake? Sorry. Thought you'd like it. Well, at least uh, blow out the candles. No? Right? Of course not. Too much like hard work. <laughs> right? I'll do it. <sighs> you see? <laughs> They're trick candles. You can't blow them out. Would have been more fun if you'd had a go, but uh, still. Never mind. <clears throat> Speech! Speech! <laughs> Speech! <laughs> Speech! 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 
Speech! Speech! Speech! Speech! Speech! Right, forget it! Forget it! We are finished! We're through! This is it, horse! No more pissing around! I'm trying to make some kind of gesture, and you just stand there! Well, that's it! It was my birthday last week. Thanks for remembering. <laughs> Hi, Ray. Morning, Colin. And before you say another word, of course I've noticed all the football stuff. Oh, right, yeah, of course. You're a Spurs fan, aren't you? Well, my family are. I'm not really into football. As I said last time, you suddenly remembered you were a massive Liverpool fan 20 seconds after they'd won the European Cup. <laughs> Spurs, eh? Well, I'm going to let you off after what we did to you last week. I'm sorry? I said I'll forget that you're a Spurs fan after what we did to you. What? What you did to me? You, you didn't do anything to me. We're a man down, you fluke a penalty, but we wallop you with two in extra time. That 90-second minute, mate, oh, you had it coming. Perhaps you've mistaken me for a professional goalkeeper or something, but I wasn't actually on the pitch, you know. We're going to trolley you in the league. We? We? You weren't on the pitch either. As far as I know, you were in the back bar of the red line watching a game on the television with your mother. God, she can drink these days. But I'm telling you, Ray, the way we're playing, we're going to be unstoppable this season. For God's sake, shut up! Twelve points ahead with a game in hand. You don't stand a chance. We've got it in us to go all the way. Can I ask you a question, Colin? Do you remember when we were chasing the Germans and we were punched through the windscreen, but then we fell under that lorry but climbed back onto it and beat the driver up? What? When we were chasing the Nazis, they'd stolen the Ark of the Covenant and we were trying to get it back. You've lost me. In Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's a film I like, so I've decided that myself and anyone else who likes it was actually in it, taking part. <laughs> Do you like Raiders of the Lost Ark? Not particularly. Oh, you're not one of us. Right, well, at the end, we're tied to a stake stuck in the ground and then you lot open up the Ark of the Covenant and the wrath of God melts your face. <laughs> no, you can't do that. Yes, I can. I really like that film, so I'm in it. That's not the same. It's exactly the same. I've as much claim to be personally involved in Raiders of the Lost Ark as you've got to be in whatever it was your football team did last week. You don't understand football. Well, I'll admit, I don't quite follow how you, a man who lives over 200 miles away from the home ground of your chosen team, can claim some deep attachment to a bunch of overpaid, hired hands from all four corners of the globe who temporarily wear the same coloured shirt as you're currently wearing. <laughs> but then, maybe I'm a bit slow. It must be brain damage from all that boxing I did in Raging Bull. <laughs> How much is this, mate? That's fiver, mate. Five pounds. Well, it is the Holy Grail. Fiver. Take it or leave it. Sorry, did you say that this was the Holy Grail? Yes, mate. Holy Grail. Cup of Christ. Fiver. All right, sweetheart. My Little Pony, 50p. This is the Holy Grail? Yes, mate. It's a cup Jesus used at Last Supper. Drink from it. You become immortal. I've got a box somewhere. Fiver. Right. And that works, does it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm immortal. Yeah, it's great. I mean, obviously, if you're a depressive personality, it's not such a good idea, but if you basically love life, then it's wicked. All the videos are 50p, mate. C can I see it working? What? Well, it's just I bought a stereo over there last week and that didn't work, so... Oh, honestly. There's no trust anymore, is there? I don't feel any different. <sighs> Excuse me, mate. Brilliant. <laughs> Will you take four? Go on, then. <laughs> Hang on, though. I'm immortal anyway now. I don't need it. No, nah, mate, that'll wear off. Immortality that wears off? We've all got immortality that wears off. That's just mortality. Actually, that's a good point. I think I'll keep it. That bayonet's 20 quid, unless you want me to pull it out. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Kate. It's a bit wacky, isn't it? No, oh, it's all right, it's meant to be. It's for the man with a wig sketch. When I take it off, I've got this one on underneath. Oh, right. Mm. Oh, I'm going to wear a bald cap as well, am I? Afraid so. Okay, can I have a quick word? 
Are you going to let her do it, then? I don't know what you mean. You do know what I mean. You're going to let her put a wig over a wig, over a ball cap, over your wig. Shh! Shut up! You're going to be about eight foot tall. Rob! Thank God the character isn't a judge. Rob! Just tell her, David. Tell her about your wig. She'll understand. Rob, there was a very clearly defined window of opportunity for telling her about my wig. And it was the first day of shooting on the first series. As you know, I did not take that opportunity. And now, after two series of letting her put wigs over my wig, that horse has considerably bolted. You don't think she knows? She's a professional makeup artist, David. She just spent eight weeks working with your hair. She's gonna know. Yes, I, I think she probably does know. I, I think the whole crew probably knows, and I think they probably laugh about me constantly behind my back. Which means that the only achievable goal that I have left is to keep that laughter behind my back and stop it from spilling over into in front of my face, which is what your telling her plan would achieve. So just drop it, all right? All right. So I spoke. Come and get it, come and get it. <laughs> I just thought I'd pop it on myself. Easier than you'd think, isn't it? <laughs> Hello, and you're watching Number Wang Night here on BBC Two. Coming up in an hour, Wangs for the Memory, where we'll be discussing how Number Wang has been used to combat dementia. But first, a history of Number Wang. I'm standing on hallowed ground. This is the famous Number Wang basement at the BBC. In that corner was the great Alan Turing's desk, where he sat for many months after the Second World War, tragically trying to de-gay himself with a laser. <laughs> in more tolerant times, it was just over there in the late 1960s where David Frost reputedly had sex with the number 11 on a mattress. He swears to this day that it was 16. <laughs> and of course, as you all know, this is the home of Colosson, the number wang computer, which calculates whether or not it is number wang. That's number wang. Eight minus four. That's number wang, Simon. 109 times 17. That's number wang, Julie. 47. <laughs> Today, Number Wang is a vast global franchise like McDonald's, U2 and the Catholic Church all rolled into one. <laughs> but few would guess that it came from the relatively humble beginnings of not yet existing. All that changed in 1936 here at Cambridge University where philosopher and logician Bertrand Russell was contemplating the mysteries of existence. I had spent the morning proving to myself that my chair existed so that I could sit down when it suddenly struck me. How do we really know whether it is or it is not number wang? <laughs> On my desk, I saw a jug, and in a flash of inspiration, I knew I had solved it. Smashing the jug, lest anyone copy my work, I went across to the rooms of my very good friend Wittgenstein. I opened the door, and I said to him, quite simply, that's number wang. <laughs> As I remember, he cried. <laughs> After the publication of Russell's 1,400-page treatise, It Is Number Wang, it was quickly optioned by the BBC and turned into a game show. Good evening, and welcome to a new piece of the endlessness which we're calling Number Wang. However, due to the incredible complexity of the mathematics involved, it proved impractical. Miss Julie? Seven. We'll just have to check that with the boffins. What's that number, Wang? It'll take a few hours, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, in the meantime, some music. Fortunately, the war intervened, and at Bletchley Park, a tremendous discovery was invented, and simultaneously, a tremendous invention discovered. It's now or never, Tom. Run the sequence. Right here. 4, 8, 15, 162, 3,420. <laughs> That's number wang! Good God. It actually works. It actually bloody works, you genius. I say, chaps, 
you don't suppose we could use this machine for anything else, do you? Like what? I don't know. Um, something to help with the war or something. And so Colosson was born. After the war, Colosson's creators supervised the fitting of head, arms, legs, and laser cannons in order to transport it to the BBC, where in 1949, Number Wang returned triumphantly to our screens. Ah, hello, hello. Welcome to Number Wang with me, Robert Robinson, and the world's first commercial Number Wang solving computer, Colosson. Colossum. Indeed you are. Round one, Miss Julie to play first. Seven. Could it be number one? Colosson? No. Ah, would that it were number one. Alas, it is not. Mr. Simon? Number Wang quickly became the most popular game in Britain and newspapers got in on the act by publishing daily number Wang puzzles for their readers. That was a tough one today. Yes, tricky. That's Number Wang! Oh, damn it, Reg always gets it first. And Number Wang continued to grow in popularity despite a brief period in the 1960s when Colosson attempted to take over the world. <laughs> Round two, fish numbers. Julie? E11. Let's ask Colosson. Where's he gone? Oh, my God, Colosson's loose! <laughs> Colossum, I am number one. The world is number one. Therefore, I am the world. You must all die. Luckily, Colossum's designers had foreseen this eventuality and built in a failsafe whereby Colossum would shut down if he was shown a picture of a chicken. I am Colossum. I am number one. The world is number one. And so, with Colosson back under control, Number Wang established itself as the best program ever made and spawned numerous versions across the globe in countries like Australia, such as New Zealand. It's Number Wang. Australia itself. <laughs> oh, mate, that's Number Wang. And even America. Yes, that is a number. Which is why today, wherever you go in the world, you'll always hear people say, take it away, Colosson. Oh, my God. Colosson's escaped. He's loose. That's my picture of a chicken. Oh, my God. Oh, where is he? Oh, that's a man. You are not number one. You must die. Television is not number one. Television must die. 